Okay. Um, hey, everybody, welcome to uh, another episode of the Joyce Stream Artist Chat. We're joined today by um, the collaborating team of Ballet Boys Production Deluxe. Um, and uh, I'm Aaron Maddox, the Director of Programming at The Joyce, and um, joined by some illustrious people from around the globe. So I will just let you guys all introduce yourselves. Should I go first? I'll wave here. Hi, I'm Michael, and I'm one of the directors at Ballet Boys. And I'm Billy, I'm the other director at Ballet Boys. And I'm Maxine Doyle, one of the choreographers, um, created um, Bradley 418. <laughs> We've lost the ship. <laughs> I lost the connection for the internet. That was your big moment. That was your big moment, you see. <laughs> I think that's here, the what you guys said, you know, it's, uh, the beginning. So I just coming coming back for now. Okay. Okay. So, Michael and Billy, um, you know, you guys have built this company. This was supposed to be your twentieth anniversary season. Um, can you talk a bit about what what it was that you wanted to accomplish with this production, and um, the choice of Maxine and Jason? Why don't you start? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, yes, this was supposed to be our 20th anniversary program, and lots of people have asked us whether we had intended to do something um, celebratory or special. But actually, what we decided to do was was to really focus on on what we had originally wanted to achieve with the company, which was to take opportunities to work with people we'd never worked with before, and to challenge ourselves or our dancers to work in new ways with new collaborators and so the um the, the two choreographers we have with us today have have um fulfilled that to uh, uh, our highest expectations good answer <laughs> <laughs> how did you guys um how did you guys meet maxine and jason uh I'm guessing each each choreographer has a different story about the relationship with ballet boys. Billy, you were in China, weren't you? I was in there at the beginning. Yeah, we we had um, we had organised a, a short tour in China, and part of that was to, to do some workshops at, at uh, Shanghai International Ballet School. And we, one of the things we really wanted to do was trying to meet some Chinese choreographers and to see if we could collaborate at some later stage. And we had um, look, looked, done some research, looked online, found some videos, and there was one that really stood out, which was Xie Xin. And we really wanted to try and hook up with her when we were in Shanghai. So we ar arranged a, a studio day with her, took our dancers and just hung out and had a great day. They gave us a lovely lunch. Uh, the dancers all work very well, and um, it seemed like a really, a really um, positive collaboration could come from that. And so, that was really interesting. At the same time, one of our former dancers was performing in Sleep No More, the punch drunk work that was on in Shanghai, that was choreographed by Maxine. So, um, we thought that that was an interesting connection, and we went to have, watch that show while we were there, and thought, wouldn't it be interesting to have these two people? create something so totally different. Their styles are so, um, uh, 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 so at odds with each other in a way that we thought it would make a really interesting double build. And uh, so that's really how it, how it sort of started. And there were lots of different permutations on the way, but we eventually managed to get them into the studio and um, started work on Deluxe. Yeah. Um, I was in uh, China in November and got to meet Jie Jin also and see her company do an excerpt of this work called From In that she's been touring for a number of years, which is um, quite extraordinary. We saw it in the studio first and just had a sense of the 
physical vocabulary and then seeing uh, an excerpt of it in full production with her lighting and collaboration with him was just um, one of the most memorable pieces that we saw in the 12 days that we were in China. Um, Jason, how you have such a incredibly unique and singular movement style and a and I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about how it was working with the ballet boys coming to uh, interpret your style or set your movement on other bodies outside of your company. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting for me because like uh, the first time I meet all the boys is when I'm pregnant three and a half months. And when I first time uh, in London, that time I was a big valley, almost six and a half months. So I used two weeks working with all the, the dancers and I really like every, every dancers there because they are full of like um, possibility and a very wide range about their, their mind and their body. So I just try a lot of uh, things how how I'm working with my dancers. But I found something because I, I used to working with a man dancer and the female dancers together. So I found like oh, all the boys, how I can make it works in another way. So I started thinking about this first question. And when I come back to China after one year, when I back to London, the second time for, for I need to finish this piece just in, two weeks and the music is there. So I feel that time I, I really, you know, it's like a big pressure because I know uh, some of the dances, they are new. And for me, only two weeks, I have to finish. So I really enjoy each one moment, a second. Or just like every day I will uh, teach a workshop with the dancers and I really saw a lot of uh, things happen one day by one day and I found one way and then it works and I just follow this direction and feels like they'll have something is uh, me and all the boys we make something in some way I don't know before so I feel really happy that I just, you know, a lot of pressure, but you just go there, whatever happens, and you take all the, all the um, opportunities, and then it's just go to the pieces own way. And I really enjoy to working with them and I use my way, but see how it happens later. So, mm -hmm. but I really like the piece ripple. Yeah. Um... Maxine, a uh, similar question for you. I saw um, the work that you did with Bobby Jean Smith at, on the Graham Company. We had that at the Joyce and really, really um, felt like it was seeing, I was seeing the Graham dancers who are just such an extraordinary ensemble um, in a really different way. And I thought it was really, really exciting what you were able to um, build there and so I'm wondering similarly with the ballet boys what your relationship with is with them if you were trying to bring something new or different out of them and I think also based on some of the footage that is in the stream um, I know it's sort of repetitive but we won't have access to the stream forever and we will be able to talk you know, see the artist chat for longer. So if you could talk about the influences of um, Kate Tempest and just sort of like how you built up the story of the work as well. Uh, yeah, so I, um, well, it was quite a, a, quite a fast um, meeting and uh, relationship with the dancers. I basically came in for a day with them in, in September and then came back a couple of weeks later to create a half an hour work, which is quite a short run in actually for me. So um, I was interested in, well, I, I was asking myself lots of questions. I was interested in like, 
um, what kind of uh, artistic conversation and physical conversation that I could have that felt authentic with these six men. Um, I was really, I really liked them, like Shishin said, I really liked their personalities and I felt inspired by all of them as performers actually. Um, a big, as they all had quite a big charismatic presence, which is always something that I'm drawn to and inspired by as a maker. So I was interested in that. And then I, I've been looking at this, um, listening to, reading this uh, concept album called Let Them Eat Chaos by Kate Tempest for a, a few years actually. And, um, and there was one particular song um, called Pictures on a Screen, which talks about a character called Bradley. And it, she just, uh, she's an incredible poet actually. And she, um, I think she really captures the voice of a generation. So she talks about this character, this young man who's doing well financially and in terms of employment and very much like a kind of a man in the, in, in the city, a little bit of a sort of stereotype, but, but then she, she, in the song she talks about how he feels like he's walking around in a dream and how all of this um, contemporary living just doesn't really feel like it satisfies him. And, and you definitely feel like he is a sort of man or a, a person on the edge of something. Um, and I, so I took these words into the studio and these ideas and I had a sort of imagining of the work in my mind, but then shared that with the dancers. And when we just began to explore the text in terms of its images, actually, um, its rhythm, um, and, we, and, and as well as, so we, we had this sort of this shared focus of a starting point. Um, and then I was also interested in like, their personality and how and, and their different physicalities and how I could make these differences um, stand out alone, stand up on their own, I should say. Um, yeah. And can I ask you, uh, it, like in terms of your creative, in, uh, not influences, yeah, I guess influences or um, people that you uh, have been inspired by in your choreographic practice. I am just gonna say one thing that I uh, connected with in terms of just like all of these men together and the different kind of portraits of um, aspects of personality. It, it made me think of the um, Enter Achilles revival that's also happening. Uh, that it was a piece that 20 years ago was really, really impactful to me. And I wonder if there's, um, if Lloyd is in your creative DNA or others like that, um, you're certainly like a dance, the, I mean, Pina could be there too, but just wonder like who, who would you name as? I mean, yeah, I mean, Pina Bell should be my sort of, um, yeah, kind of guru, my, my guru. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On one end of the sort of theatrical world, but then I also, over the years, I'm interested, really inspired by companies like the Worcester Group, actually, and um, on the other end of the spectrum, Forsyth, in terms of his mechanics, movement mechanics. So, a sort of a range, but I, I studied English as well as dance at university, so I've always had an interest in narrative and drama and characters. Um, and I saw interest, you know, I saw Enter Achilles the yeah. first all those years ago and I was I know several dancers that are in the the new creation of it and I was actually aware in the back of my head that that was a work about men um, that was going to be in the public sphere um, and I was actually pretty um, clear with the dancers we were all in, in an agreement that it, this wasn't Bradley 418 wasn't to be a work that was really about how men behave with men right I didn't feel like I was interested in making that sort of comment when there's been so many beautifully made statements about that, those kind of relationships. So I was much more interested in digging into the sort of psyche and the personas of one character and then using the fiction of Tempest to sort of hang that on. So we looked at, you know, we, we tried to be a little bit clever and we looked at sort of Carl Jung and um, actually there was a really interesting um, Lucy and Freud exhibition on mm -hmm. that to be on at the time of his um, all of his self portraits so that was kind of fascinating actually seeing how an artist represents themselves in paint so um, there was lots of different sources that were sort of coming in 
Yeah, I think that's such an um, important point that uh, the difference between something like an Achilles is really about um, men's group dynamics. And this is really kind of like a, a single caricature and in, in a way like refracted between multiple aspects of personality and yeah, self-portraiture. I think that's yeah. a really, um, thank you. And uh, Zhejin, if you could stop drinking for a second, <laughs> you know that bad no, I think um, JJ, if you're, you might have to restart because it looks like you're frozen. But I would love to um, have the same question to you about just your influences and your um, sort of choreographer's DNA in terms of um, your own training and performance and history that you bring that you bring to the studio. Looks like she might be frozen. We are lost. <laughs> Maybe I'll so, chat with her and see if she'll restart. Um, so, me, while you do that, I'll tell you something about the differences between the way I, that we saw these two choreographers create. How's that? While you do a yeah, bit of tech, I would love that. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it seems to me that that Maxine is looking to to. Uh, understand what she needs from the from the dancers themselves she goes into the room without without necessarily a clear uh, physical picture of what's what's required a kind of a, a mental idea of um, a theme a plot uh, some sensibilities but waiting to see what the dancers respond with before she knows what it is which direction it's going to go and I feel like Shishin maybe is the opposite of that she has a very clear idea of what she wants and she can demonstrate and she's willing to demonstrate even six months pregnant exactly what it is she's looking for um, and and she and her dancers have this e e extraordinary kind of uh, physicality that means that they can bend in any direction and several directions at once yeah and so, um, for dancers that the we, that we're generally looking for a, a kind of a wider versatility they don't necessarily have that physicality and so the, the challenge for shishin was to work out how to how to get them to to understand the kind of the root sensibility of her movement style not it wouldn't necessarily ever look like it looks for her and her dancers but it would have the same intention and the same drive running through it and, and I, think, you know, I think it was um they, they were quite depressed, weren't they, at first? You know, you get that as a dancer, you get that sort of physical depression where you, you, your body just won't right. like, do what the You're never going to be able to look like that. Yeah. yeah. And the physical like, and the pain of that, three days yeah. later, you know, when you're waking up and you try to bend double and put your head where it shouldn't really go, yeah. it, <laughs> it, uh, it slowly got to them. But I think it was really nice that, that she did the couple of weeks and then disappeared back to China. And they had a chance just to sort of assimilate it and get it into their heads before she returned. I think that was a was a saving grace. Otherwise, she would have just broken them all, and we wouldn't have had a company. Right. To continue with the creation, yeah, right. we wouldn't be here now. Yeah. I mean, it really is um, to try to describe like her movement. Uh, it's it just it feels like you're watching liquid mercury, and and there's this incredible uh, swirling circularity and the, the energy of her choreography, it's almost like it never ends. It's just like, mm -hmm. it just sort of like cascades over, you know, across the stage and around and everything. And I, I can imagine, I mean, you know, entering into a process with a very specific training and background as your company has to watch her move and just be like, uh, oh, uh, uh. <laughs> yeah. I don't, my, I don't, I don't, that doesn't, I don't do that. <laughs> yeah, that's more or less what happened. Yeah. yeah. There, there's one magic moment for me, and I think, I think you guys are going to show it. There's a little pre film before you see Ripple. Yes. And, um, she's, she's explaining about the movement of the work, and there's, there's just the phrase where she moves her hands. And when we were in the theater for the five times that we performed it live before we got <laughs> shut down, you could see people's jaws just sort of drop because it was just so beautiful. That moment, that five seconds, you just get it. You get what she's about. Yeah. Yeah, it's a magical moment for me. Um, so I'm gonna take 
uh, we may have lost Asian for good. I'm not sure, but um, <laughs> she's gone down to the off license. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> she, well, I I want to take an opportunity because you guys have such a um, a rich relationship with filmmaking, in addition to being artistic directors of a dance company, and I think we're in a really interesting moment um, where everybody, including us in this very moment, are sort of putting a ton of content out into the world um, to, I think, inspire and continue to engage with audiences around dance and to make up for all of this loss of shows and plans and all of that. Um, but I would love for us all to engage in a conversation around the, um, the sort of debate or value of liveness for a group of people that have all spent our careers in different ways, making humans in a room the most important part of our craft in a way uh, outside of the actual artistic creation that like the relationship of the audience to the work, I mean, something like Sleep No More, it has, really dramatically shifted um i mean mm -hmm. it created a culture of immersive theater i think or was part of the creation of a, mm -hmm. a culture of immersive theater and that really requires um audience architecting i mean the audience is uh so important to that and i think as filmmakers you guys have made some really incredible contributions to dance on film and i'm wondering just like in this moment how everybody is grappling with <clears throat> that feeling of liveness and wanting to make sure that audiences come back to the theater and see deluxe mm. for real but also you guys make really smart and specific choices about how you do represent dance on film that i think could be um replicated by others perhaps is nice. <laughs> but or just seen as a template you guys are really kind of um leaders in your archiving and documenting of the work and so i would just love for us all to just argue about liveness mm -hmm. and uh film and dance and the ways that those are different and valuable Shall I start? I, uh, it's interesting because Billy and I have been talking recently over these these Zoom chats about um, our next project, and and um, we've decided that our next project will be digital, and there won't be humans watching this live in a theatre. But it will start its life as a digital medium and then progress to a live format, rather than the other way round. And I think. For a long time, and I think it's, a, it's, it's coming from the big opera houses where some of us have worked, where you keep the work very close and it's, um, you, you can only see it if you, if you pay lots of money to go to the theatre to see it. Um, and there's a fear that once it's been on television or it's been on the internet, then nobody will want it anymore and it's worthless. Yeah. But I think it's almost the opposite. I think the more you can expose the work, the more you can show it, the more people are going to want to see it in the theatre. Because I think, you know, dance is great, but people are still frightened of it. And they won't choose to go to see it necessarily live. But if they can watch your show online, be it, you know, the deluxe, Billy shot that from the front row on the far <laughs> right hand side. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a very conscious choice of his, because that's, that's just a seat. You get, you know, you pay your money and you get that one seat and you sit there. And um, I think what he's done is represent that, that performance in a really interesting way. Um, and, and I'm watching it thinking, well, I'd probably go to the theatre, but I'd like to sit maybe somewhere near the back or on the left hand side. Um, so moving away, I think I move away from the sort of four cameras that all, you know, shine it straight at the proscenium arch and, um, you know, cut every five seconds. So we, it, it feels more like television. It's not television, it's theatre. And I think it needs to be thought about differently when it's shot and directed. Mm -hmm. That was a long answer, wasn't it? Sorry about that. Yeah. Shishin's back though. She's thinking about it. She's thinking about <laughs> that. <laughs> She's thinking, where did I put my glass down? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, Billy, what was the the idea of that? I mean, maybe Michael said it already, but just that that one seat, you're there, that's the perspective if you happen to sit in the front row or something versus, um, right, the four camera shoot, the highly edited like film of the show. Well, it was a combination of things, actually. The first was that we had a suspicion that the theatres were about to be shut down. So if we didn't get a, a version of it, then we wouldn't have one. Yeah. But that, that coupled with having filmed it in the studio, which we do all the time, we're filming lots of rehearsals and, and um, sometimes for practical use, you know, for, for the choreographers to look at and to watch back um, in the evening or whatever. And sometimes just so that we've got a really... <laughs> version of it and um we'd shot both pieces in the studio from a fixed point with one camera just following them. sometimes pushing into the action sometimes trying to get as wide as possible but just it, it feels like one point of view and we had decided that perhaps we would try that with deluxe we would try and just get a camera on the stage right in inside the action almost and just have one one pov to follow it around and and those two things happened to be the only thing that was possible when, <laughs> when it came to shoot it. So, so it, it worked out. And I, I think, I, I just, I like, you're always going to have the director's choices in a, in a, a screen version, unless you've got some kind of incredible um, 360 AI, 3D, whatever it is thing going on where you can make your own choices. You're basically being directed what you're going to look at by, by whoever's pointing the camera or, or making the edits. And so you're following what I think is interesting as I'm watching the show and mm -hmm. and take it or leave it. Yeah. Um Jijin, do you have uh have you worked with film or do you have um a feeling about the differences between having something seen on video versus being in a theater with your dancers performing? Can I can I follow this question later? Because I think I I just the internet for me is now is a problem because I just ah, uh, um, okay. sometimes miss the conversation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, Maxine, how about you? What's your take? Um, on? Well, it's interesting because I I think I can like I any stage work I think I conceive it quite cinematically anyway, and I think that's part of part of my lineage with Punch Drunk creating, <clears throat> creating many different frames at once, thinking about a 360 dimensional uh, perspective. So, um, I, you know, what I love, what I love when dance is filmed really well is when it is really, it can be really close and you can really feel like you can see the dancer uh, as well as the movement. And I think that's what the, um, Ballet boys do really well actually. They allow you to sort of engage with the form, but actually you get the rhythm, the energy, the dynamic, the life of, of the work. Um, and it's, I mean, I've been, you know, I've been, I think we're very privileged to be part of a community of artists and a community of dancers. And I've been, you know, like many dancers doing classes, class in my living room or in my kitchen and, and, and actually feeling for half an hour that I'm in a room with people and there's something there's been something really hopeful about that um, and I think there's probably quite a lot of learnings that we can sort of take forward in terms of how the digital experience can maybe enrich uh, enrich our experience or exposure to a work that then can feed back into you know a time when we can be in a room with each other and hold each other and I think I think we will all come out of this, 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 this learning. And I'm, you know, so grateful to the directors for having the vision and the energy and the drive to collaborate with theatres like the Joyce and 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 actually put this work out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting that um, the idea of perspective because when I watch dance, uh, I prefer to be sort of back from it. Um, in the theater and you know our seats at the Joyce are like in the second to last row and I love to just like I like to see the whole frame of choreography um, yeah. 
But there's also like when we were visiting in China, I realized after, you know, days and days of studio visits that I hadn't spent much time in a studio since I retired from dancing and how much I missed being like really um, intimately in the room with dancers working and that that's a completely different perspective. And I agree with you, Maxine, that um, what I love about uh, the film or what I think is most successful about dance on film is when you do get that super close and this is a totally per this is not a, uh, this is personal personal but um that I, I love that getting to feel that energy and the character and the dancers faces and seeing them really differently and it's an experience that i don't want in the theater i don't want to sit in the front row i know some people really do and love to be like in the sweat zone you know but I, I really, in a theater, want to sit back and like see all the stagecraft and the whole, because that's where the choreographers sit when they're doing tech. You know, tech tables are not in the second row. They're in the, you know, two thirds of the way back. So I, but in film, I love being like right in the action, almost like the camera is on stage as another dancer. And, um, I think there are ways, Michael, I absolutely agree that uh, part of this is kind of outreach and exposure and that people like yourselves could and are, I think, um, bringing people to a form through exposure. And um, I mean, I could imagine a really fascinating film version of Sleep No More, you know, like that almost in a way could lend itself very easily, especially in that like AR or like choose your own adventure way that the whole um, digital space could be built around the audience getting to choose each person getting to choose their experience. But um, well, I we, don't we, think, sorry, so we, oh, no. actually, um, we, we shot a big film uh, we shot Romeo and Juliet for the Royal Ballet. You, you guys haven't got it yet, but I think it's out on PBS uh, in September. Um, and a lot of people have asked why we shot that as a, as a movie. We took the entire Royal Ballet, we took them to Hungary, and we, we literally rebuilt Verona. And uh, we shot Romeo and Juliet in the streets. And, and the idea was, is that Billy and I were in that production many years ago. Um, and we always felt that production was much, much better when you were in it rather than when you were watching it. <laughs> and how could we, uh, how could we show that perspective? And, uh, and the feedback we get is exactly that. People feel like they're a member of the cast and it, and it takes you on that voyage. A bit like we, you were talking about with Sleep No More, you know, you, you're moving from room to room, from environment to environment. And um, people forget they're watching a, a classical ballet. And, yeah. um, and it's not about the steps, it's about the narrative, it's about the journey you're on. Um, yeah. And so that was, that was fascinating for us. And we had to throw out a lot of the rules um, with ballet. You know, you, you get crucified if you cut somebody's feet off. Yeah. On, on a, but we just had to forget that. And, and uh, Billy was the cinematographer on that. And we just worked out how would we, we just want to tell the story. And if it's not necessary, and it's not telling the story, then we get rid of it. So a lot of the big group dances where people are just sort of wandering around for, for 10 minutes, gone. Mm -hmm. um, just to keep it moving, keep it moving on. So I hope you guys will see that at some point as well. Yeah, yeah. How, what does that do to the score? Does the, <laughs> you like... <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> Billy, Billy, um, Billy did a lovely job with the Prokofiev score. Um, yeah. It was one of the first things we did actually. So about two years before we started shooting, we, we started to storyboard the film and um, Billy started to cut the score and then that had to be delivered back to the Prokofiev Foundation who would listen to it through just to make sure it maintained the, the correct narrative and, and, and uh, yeah. Jason, have you worked with, um, directly with film? Have you choreographed for film? Oh, wait, hold on, sorry. 
we have a we have a nice environment and we have a very um, you know the soft quality about the costume so we try to make everything um, like the quality comes together uh, including the the movement so and I also think the choreographer and also the 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 film director they are they are trying to find the logical about the way how to how to leading the focus for the audience. I think it's really interesting experience for me. But for me, I I focus more that in the theater because the the live show, the live performance is more uh, valuable for me. It's like the audience can breathe together with the performer. I think the, that's the most uh, beautiful moment. It's, it's interesting because I do think there's that element of being together and the, the collective experience of gathering. And mm. uh, it's been kind of interesting and fun to actually watch the first digital stream that we did, we did it with the live chat on the side and hearing people's response. I mean, it's a different level of um, attention and distraction, I guess, because there's this other thing running alongside, but it does actually allow you to, in that digital space, Maxine, kind of like you're saying about taking class and being in a room, it does make you all feel like, um, you can say like, oh my God, that's my favorite dancer. And everybody else gets to be like, oh, I love this moment when she does that. And it it does actually kind of in new ways replicate that experience of getting to be at intermission and hearing somebody say, oh my God, that's that's the my favorite dance I've ever seen. And you just jump in and say something in agreement, you know. Um, and I think, you know, in our efforts, in all of this that uh, we're doing with the Joyce stream, um, I say again and again to everybody that I can't wait for the Joyce audience and audiences around the world to experience all of your work live in a theater again very soon. It's very important to us that this is um, a way to keep you know, for us in the industry, dance is so easy for us to access in our own lives. And I think what we forget some, or not what we forget, but we're trying to keep the audience who maybe comes to the Joyce because we give them that uh, interaction with dance, that we are continuing to give them something uh, to connect with a form that they love, but that we are actively, or I'm trying to actively remind everybody during all of these chats that um, we can't wait to have Deluxe in our theater. We can't wait to have audiences in a room together watching Maxine and Jason's work, that that is um, really important to us uh, and the, the world that we create, because I do think we can make incredible films and I think people like yourselves are going to be innovating the forms that we choose to engage with dance in the future based on the experiences that we're having right now. Um, and that could mean that we see more work that's being built specifically for digital spaces first. I think that's the difference that I'm also noticing is that some of this is just archival and that's okay. We're, we're allowed to just like see the dance and it feels like water in the desert for some of us, but um, it's also like, I think choreographers will start to think about what is it like to make a, a piece or work for an iPhone, you know, just to like take to have an experience on the subway with dance. And I think that will also change and build the audience. But um, it's still a ritual of like we've been gathering in arenas, concerts, sports, you know, it's part of our culture for thousands of years. I don't think that we're gonna stop coming back into a room together to have community around art, but it's, um, I miss it. <laughs> it's really nice to spend some time with you guys in this kind of room. Um, 
we've been missing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! You know the the picture at my side, except me, everything is black. Oh, so I cannot actually now see see the face, you guys. Oh no! Can you hear us, though, Shifton? Can you hear us? Um. Yeah. Sometimes um, it's stopped, but sometimes uh, now it's working. Okay. Can you, can you, there so, was, you know, sometimes okay. I was uh, a little bit confused. Okay, there was a question earlier for you um, about who your choreographic oh, really? influences might be. Who influences your work? Oh, um, because as you know, as you know, I, I was working in uh, four different contemporary dance companies in China. And after that, I would... I got a scholarship, so I traveled a lot in Europe, in New York, and in Israel. So it's not any, it's not someone really influenced for me that's really, really big. It's like, um, with some, uh, for so many years, I was um, working with so many different people. So at one point when i when i came to new york i also saw some performance enjoys i enjoyed a lot and also that times i just feels like i opened my mind for everything is possible for that time i really goes to in my own way to talking with myself and thinking my own way so start that moment i think I was still curious about uh, the other people, how they're working with their body in the theater, but at another opposite way, I was more curious about how, um, how, how about me, how I think about this uh, situation, this question. So I, I spent more time to uh, talking with myself, with my own body in the studio, in the, in, you know, yeah. So there is no someone, but it's like everyone is, is uh, inspired me to open, uh, um, to like uh, still open my curious, but still like research yourself and trusting yourself more deeply. Thank you. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> I, feel like I feel that I'm lost again. No, no, you're here. No, you're here. I was thinking about how to try to describe to audiences in New York who are maybe unfamiliar, just like how cool Jay Jin is, like, and intimidating, and like, <laughs> just like, like so, like you go to China and everybody's got like, um you know people have all this merch and everywhere we went we were getting handed like special stuff but they then gave us like clothing like designs outfits and a bag and it was just like hey, how are you like the coolest person that i've ever seen is <laughs> uh i don't know it's kind of uh um really something can support the company you know yeah. For the for the training clothes, like this one is also is also for uh, from our company. Yeah, it's really nice that <laughs> I choose the the fabric and also decide about the details and also the design and talking with the the factory the details. So it's also like the um, the design and you how you how how you thinking about the uh, quality. Yeah. It does say. Her, her whole world is this like constant aesthetic of just like ripple. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and all the fabric, all the quality is really is really soft and the way you dance, you will you yeah. will love something just follow your body. Did you guys get outfits from Jay We did it. Yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> You guys make me feel like a little bit shame. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> we, we love them. I've only just taken yeah. mine off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's probably a really great chat length for people's attention spans to watch other people talk. <laughs> um, but it's been really nice to, I, I woke up 
to, I'm in New York time, so it's like almost 10 o'clock. So I got to wake up to you guys today. And um, thank you all for joining us, Jajin. I will have a glass. Have a nice day. I will cheers yeah. to you in a few hours. <laughs> um, but it's really, thank you for sharing this work with us. Thank you for making the work. Um, I can't wait to experience it live in a theater and have our audiences do the same. Um, and until then, sending you all safety and health for you and yours. And um, I look forward to being in a room with you all again. Be good. Very right. soon. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Be healthy. Be well. Be good. So long. <laughs>